present the some of our project for you mainly, but I have like introductory slides about uh, thorium because this symposium is called after thorium and and uh, it's atom craft version too. So let's look if there is really something on it. So uh, we have three major isotopes as a natural resources. They were mentioned already. A uh, little bit more from particle physics point of view, uh, looking on them, we have uranium-235, okay, we call it family uranium-5. It is fissile because the binding energy of the neutron when it interacts is higher than the fission barrier, so you can create excited nuclei which is then fissioning. Then we have uranium-8, it's not the case there. It's capturing the neutron and uh, creating an uh, isotope of uranium-239. But uh, we know, and people are showing it, that this uh, element is decaying to plutonium-239, plutonium-9, which is fissile again, because the binding energy of the last neutron is higher than the fission barrier. Uh, thorium, thorium has one major isotope on it, thorium-2, is not fissile again, and again can create fissile element, which is uh, uh, uranium-3, and there, there is the half uh, the half life of the protactinium, which is 27 days, which leads to parasitic captures on protactinium in uh, many reactors, or in potentially many reactors. The neptunium is decaying much faster, so there is not such an issue in plutonium cycle. And okay, again, uranium three is fissile because of the uh, fission barrier being smaller than the binding energy. That being said. It's not always true that you will fission the element. It may also capture the neutron. So this nuclei can be de-excited and stay as is. On the other hand, this nuclei can be also fission. So what you should look on is a fission probability. So what is the probability if the nuclei will interact with neutrons that it will be fission or not? And you should look on it as a function of energy of the neutron which you have. And uh, here is the chart. You can spend three, four hours speaking about this chart. Uh, let's be faster. So this is a fission probability. So from zero to one, that the uh, nuclei will be fission by interaction of with neutron. The rest of probability means capture. Now, the red curve is uranium three. So you see that fission probability for uranium three is excellent. Is the best in both thermal area. This is the energy of thermal neutrons, <coughs> and in fast area. Yes. If you look on plutonium. It's really bad in thermal spectrum, and not so good in fast spectrum too. Maybe at the very hard spectrum it's equalizing, but that's it. For uranium-5, the working horse today, yeah, it's acceptable in thermal spectrum. It's also not good for fast reactors. And the last point I want to say here is if you look on the uranium-8, uranium which is fertile, which is not fissioning, and thorium-2, which is also not fissioning, they start to be fissile if you have neutrons with certain energy. And uranium-8 is becoming fissile much faster, and you can have a direct fission of uranium-8, which may be up to five times more uh, probable than for thorium. Okay, I put this in the, on the slide, but it is just repetition what I said. So, so uh, thorium cycle advantage is this very high probability of fission of uranium, Plutonium cycle advantage may be partly this high fission ability or higher fission ability in fast spectrum and probably operation in that area. But fission probability is not all the story. Kirk already introduced that you also should care about the number of neutrons you release per fission. So if you multiply the fission probability with number of neutrons which you release, you get a value which is called eta, and this is beloved <coughs> by professors of reactor physics. I don't know if you ever heard about it, but uh, this is a number which you can use to explain if you can breathe or not. And as Kirk said, roughly speaking, you need one neutron to maintain the chain reaction and one neutron <coughs> to breathe additional fissile element. And here are the curves or, or the probabilities uh, multiplied by the number of neutrons. So what you can see now that uranium-3 is above the two neutron, the required two neutron line in both thermal and fast spectra, but is more or less equal in fast and thermal spectra. And that plutonium here, it's somehow around it, so probably you can not operate it as a breeder in thermal spectra. 
but in the fast spectra, it's suddenly performing better than thorium. And if you go to very hard spectra, it's really, really better also because of, you see here, eta eat, eat of, of uranium-8, yes? And because you can fish in uranium-8, you should more or less add there an additional line. Not two neutrons, but 1.9 one neutrons. Because there could be up to 10% fissioning happening on uranium-8, <coughs> uranium plutonium cycle. This is still not uh, the full story. Uh, we will come uh, later to this. Now, uh, Kirk already showed the reserve we have for the three main major isotopes which we can use. It's uh, uranium-5. Let's say that this is the relative size of uranium-5 we have. 140 times more of uranium-8 and <coughs> 3 to 4 times more of thorium. But if this reserve of uranium-5 may be good for one century, we have probably more than enough uranium-8 for 5,000 years, and maybe here it is, I don't know, 20,000 years. So this is one advantage of thorium, but probably not so strong. Now, uh, there is a, a chart or scheme showing the, the fission, but uh, probably I don't need to spend much time, because you need one neutron to cause the next fission in the chain reaction. You need to capture one neutron on the fuel, let's say uranium-8 and thorium-2, creating new fissile, which comes back to the beginning. So you can say that the fissile, uranium-3 or plutonium-9, is a catalyzer, and that you are burning uranium-8 or thorium-2. Uh, so you need two neutrons, roughly, to run this, and you have 0 0.5 to 0 0.9 neutrons to waste to, for, through leakage or through absorption. So now, uh, what is the ideal reactor we would like to have? It's, it's more or less a never-ending fire where you are burning nuclear fuel. So you are catalyzing it with plutonium-9 and uranium-3, and you use uranium-8 or thorium-2 as a fuel, and produce energy. That's what we want. Unfortunately, this works only if you continuously or batchwise remove fission products. Oh, sorry. Remove fission products, which is the case in uh, fire, because we have a uh, a smoke coming out, therefore the fire is staying. If it will be closed area, of course you need also oxygen, but uh, the smoke will kill it. So, so uh, to keep, let's say, the fuel inside of the reactor and remove just the fission products, you need recycling. And here's the first point that liquid fuel may really bring advantage in recycling, but it was already discussed. If you will recycle the fuel, it will eventually later on uh, establish a uh, kind of equilibrium fuel composition. Okay, equilibrium closed fuel cycle composition. And now uh, let's have a look what happens if you irradiate thorium <coughs> in a reactor. So we have thorium, it's capturing a neutron, becoming thorium-3, so two beta decays, creating uranium-3. Now, there are two numbers, light blue and dark blue. This is for thermal reactor, this is for fast reactor. And uh, the numbers which will now pop up are normalized to thorium. So what happens with uranium-3? It's fission, but there is a chance, roughly 10% chance, that it will fail the fission. So it will capture the neutron and create uranium-4. And now here you have the reaction rates of uh, uranium-3 interacting with neutrons, and here you have the mass, which is 100%, and the rest is normalized to that. So you have like 11% chance that it will fail in thermal spectrum, 9 in fast. Uranium-4 is not fissile, so it will be transmuted to uranium-5. And again, as Kirk mentioned already, this fission of uranium-5 must fail to go high, to higher elements. If it fails, you go more or less through several captures up to plutonium-8, plutonium-9. And firstly, here you start to produce, let's say, higher elements. If you compare it, uh, you produce plutonium-4, and this is the gateway to americium and, and uh, curium and so on. If you compare it with uranium plutonium cycle, you start at uranium-8 and immediately produce plutonium and you are there. Uh, it's necessary to say here that uh, americium and curium and the plutonium isotopes, they are long-lived radioactive waste. On the other hand, these isotopes of uranium are also radioactive and they will be as uh, traces or reprocessing losses in the waste, but still they will be better from the long-term perspective than what we produce here. 
There is one disadvantage of thorium cycle is that thorium two can undergo end-to-end -end reaction. Okay, it may be advantage for another point. It creates through complicated way way uranium two, and this this element is alpha decaying through the same decay chain as thorium, but it has a short half life, so it's produced uh, many more daughters and creates very hard gamma emitters. Uh, I have it on this slide, so you see this joining the uranium <coughs> thorium to decay chain and then the, at the end there, there are very hard uh, uh, gamma, gamma element uh, 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 isotopes like bismuth, tellurium and polonium. So if you, if you want to reprocess irradiated thorium, you need to have shielding. Okay, in reprocessing facility you have always shielding, but in fabrication facility it's not the case to have shielding. You, usually you don't need it. But in this case you will need it, but uh, it's, it's possible, it just will cost a little bit more. On the other hand, in the uranium-plutonium cycle, you will have these higher elements, this americium and curium, and they are alpha decaying, producing heat, and also producing neutrons. So to fabricate a uh, fuel, solid fuel, like pellet, including ammonium and curium, it's not so straightforward because it will emit heat and you will need to cool the pellet in all the steps before you put it in the cladding and then immediately you will need to cool the cladding. So there is also a challenge. And both these issues may be handled much better if you will have used liquid fuel. So the molten salt reactor, where there is no fabrication and where you can use a kind of biochemistry or reprocessing methods, uh, can accommodate better both uh, uh, the minor actinides from uranium plutonium cycle and the uh, uranium decay and thorium uh, fuel cycle. <coughs> now, uh, there are two salts, it was already mentioned, uh, uh, chlorides and fluorides. And uh, just to mention, in the 70s uh, there, was, there was a research running at PSI, or at the time it was Eigenossische Institute für Reaktorforschung, and and you, already at the time you can find pictures like this. Uh, it was Professor Taube thinking about chloride, chloride breeder. The chlorides are relevant for uranium plutonium cycle mainly because they provide very hard neutron spectrum and high plutonium solubility in the salt. Uh, the hard spectrum is caused by the transparency of the salt for the neutrons. So what is disadvantage of chloride? You need to have a big core to reduce the leakage, or you need to use blankets or efficient reflectors. That's the only way uh, how to not lose too many neutrons from the transparent core. On the other hand, fluorides, they are very good marriage with thorium cycle in both thermal and fast <coughs> spectrum, because they have excellent neutron, neutronic performance. They don't absorb neutrons. But on the other hand, they have low solubility of plutonium. So uranium plutonium cycle would be probably not possible in fluorides. Uh, the low capture probability of uranium-3 also means that you don't produce much higher elements and the thorium may therefore act as a semi-inert matrix if you want to burn plutonium. Because if you load plutonium together with uranium to the reactor, you will produce new plutonium. If you load plutonium with thorium to the reactor, you will burn the plutonium, not creating new one. So that may be another advantage of thorium. Now, uh, you establish in equilibrium with representative recycling, you establish kind of uh, uh, composition of fuel which is given, and each of the isotopes from this composition will consume neutrons. Now, let's say you have nu, which is like number of neutrons per fission, you need two for chain reaction and for breeding, so the excess is uh, this term. And if you divide it by all available neutrons, you get roughly a reactivity. Reactivity as measure of excess of neutrons. And this reactivity is consumed by absorption and leakage. And if you do simulation on a cell level where you don't have leakage, just look on absorption, you can express an excess reactivity. So this is a very hard chart. I will try to explain it at my best. So looking on thorium uranium cycle and fluoride salt, we have pure salt here, and then step by step we are adding graphite to moderate the reactor, and somewhere here there is a moderated <coughs> reactor. And this is the excess of neutrons, so let's say this is the 0.45 of free neutrons from each fission, and this is how they are consumed. 
So this is the own consumption of uranium-3, consumption of uranium-5, other uranium, plutonium, minor arachnoid, salt, and in the moderated case also graphite. And you have two maxima here, local maxima. It is the fast MSR with thorium, uranium cycle and fluoride salt, and this is the thermal MSR. So this is the working point for KX reactor. This is the working point for some of our reactor for the European project. And this excess reactivity you will waste by absorption or by leakage from the reactor and other absorption because the, uh, yes. We then we did the same study looking on thorium cycle and fluoride uh, and chloride salt. Yes, it was uh, table salt more or less. But for the natural isotopic composition and then for the enriched chlorides, for only chloride 37. <coughs> and you see that if it is enriched, it is performing better. It has a higher excess reactivity than, than the fluorides. On the other hand, I mentioned that uh, uh, yeah, there are all the advantages and disadvantages for chlorides. So, so uh, but then we did the same study with uranium, plutonium, cycle and fluoride salt. What you can see here, that you have m bigger excess of neutrons. You have up to 0 0.9 neutrons per fission excess, so the reactivity here is higher. Yeah, it's divided by the number, so it's uh, these, roughly these numbers, and multiplied by 100,000 to be in uh, PCM units. But the consumption, own consumption of plutonium is already tremendous, and then the other isotopes, because they are in equilibrium composition, eats a lot, and you end up by probably the same reactivity excess as here. Roughly, it is the same uh, same number. And in thermal spectrum, you can forget it. You cannot breed with uranium-plutonium cycle in thermal spectrum with graphite, at least. And the last chart missing there, uranium-plutonium cycle and chlorides, and especially for the enriched salt, that's the, the best performance on this slide, actually, from a reactivity point of view. The own consumption of plutonium becomes smaller because you have very hard spectrum and the fission probability is increased. Mm -hmm. And the excess reactivity is huge, and it enables a breed and burn mode. So this is what is so attractive for Terra Power while they are looking on fluorides, that you can operate it in breed and burn modes. So just to summarize before I come to the actual presentation of uh, some of our project, thorium reserves are higher, three, four times, uh, but uranium-8 is better fissile in the hard spectrum, but Plutonium-9 has slower fission probability than uranium-3, but more neutrons. Uh, in hard spectrum, I spoke here about chlorides, uh, the fission probability increases and you can use it for breed and burn mode. Breed and burn mode more or less mean that you load inside uh, a chloride salt just with uranium and you remove a little bit of the salt which is spent. You don't do any reprocessing or recycling. But the chlorides are transparent, probably will need a bigger core and blanket or reflector. This is the case of Terra Power, they are thinking about uh, the reflector. <coughs> uh, uranium-3 has very high fission probability, but not so many neutrons. Uh, but it has slower production of higher actinides, so it's relatively uh, cleaner waste stream. It can serve as a semi-inert uh, matrix, and uh, the, the fluoride salt which has low absorption are fully fitting to this cycle. The, the scattering cross-section of fluoride is uh, bigger and the fluoride is lighter, so the spectrum is softer and uh, the, the salt is then therefore less transparent and the cores can be more compact. Uh, fluorides have low solubility for plutonium, so the uranium-plutonium cycle will be probably challenging if somebody will go for that. And uh, for both salts, Isotopic enrichment uh, will be probably needed. In case of uh, fluoride salt, it will be lithium-7 enrichment, and in fluoride, uh, chloride, chlorine-37. Uh, liquid fuel can bring some simplification of fuel recycling. At best, we should use some cleaning method. At best, something like uh, something evaporating from the salt or precipitating from the salt. And last but not least, bring some safety advantages. Many of them were already mentioned. For me, the biggest advantage is that you are continuously removing the volatile and gaseous elements. So whatever was released during the accident in Fukushima, those are elements which you are continuously removing here from the core. So you are preparing the core for accident that doesn't else will be released. Okay, maybe I will... Oh, yeah, second half, five minutes. So no questions. So, uh, some of our...
It's a, it's a coordinated Horizon 2020 project. It, it has 11, 11 members of the consortium. There are some uh, typical players in the MSR field, historical like TU Delft, uh, CNRS uh, in Grenoble, uh, ITU Karlsruhe, or, or uh, CIRTEN, which is consortium of Italian uh, universities. Uh, and then other partners, for instance, from Mexico, yeah, and, and also uh, Switzerland. So we are just one of the 11 members. The main objective of the project is uh, to prove the innovative safety of molten salt reactor or molten salt fast reactor and uh, there will breakthrough in the safety and waste uh, management and last but not least create consortium of stakeholders to demonstrate uh, how the development will go after this project. Uh, main expected result is proof of concept for several uh, particular things, safety assessment and update of conceptual design and the roadmap. Uh, so it's European Commission Horizon 2020 project. The coordinator is Helen Klosterman. Okay, classical structure of European project. Five technical working packages. Uh, some observers, some links to non-European projects. And uh, I have now five slides, let's say, for the technical technical working packages to introduce them. So working package one, integral safety assessment. Uh, we plan to develop a power, simula uh, power plant simulator study the dynamics behavior of the reactor during uh, startup shutdown uh, load following operations but also development and integral safety uh, assessment method and evaluate the risk of the reactor and uh, looking on the proliferation aspects so most interesting for you may be this slide showing the design it was optimized to minimize the salt volume to have the lowest possible uh, uh, fuel load to increase the doubling time and if you will have chance to see the TerraPower picture which they uh, published recently, it doesn't look much different. It's also optimized for minimal volume. It is fast spectrum reactor, but uh, it's not fully hard spectrum as in sodium fast reactor, it's slightly softer. Uh, 3000 megawatt thermal. It's probably challenging. I'm not sure if this is realistic, but it, it is really small reactor with very high power. It is the same salt like uh, in Copenhagen atomics case, actually, uh, so I will not go to details. It has negative coefficients. Feedback coefficients are negative because if you heat up the salt, you have less fuel in the reactor. Working package 2 is dedicated to the uh, uh, safety-related chemical data. The highlights here is the plan to create a, a equivalent inactive salt and measure the phase diagram of the salt. Uh, development of some experimental techniques and uh, uh, examining precipitates after upon supercooling and uh, evaporation by higher temperatures. But what is, for instance, also very interesting is uh, retention of iodine and cesium, which should be measured. It, it was partly already done, and the preliminary results are showing that these elements are fully dissolved in the salt and are not leaving the salt. Uh, working package 3 is dedicated to experimental validation. There will be two big facilities, one for decay heat removal and uh, one for uh, freeze plug uh, uh, experimental proof. So there will be facility uh, tracking or more looking on the freezing plug, uh, how fast it is the freezing, how it works, uh, how fast the salt can be drained and so on because as Kirk said, the salt if you have C-Rex, then it can be drained from the core to another constellation where it is better pullable. Working package 4 is numerical assessment. We are planning to use cutting-edge modern tools uh, to simulate uh, the dynamics of a molten salt reactor, uh, normal and abnormal operation, decay heat removal, and uh, thermal expansion of the vessel or freezing in subsections and so on. And working package five is about the safety of chemical processing. So there's also a reprocessing scheme. Uh, several steps are similar to what Kirk presented. And for instance, the liquid metal extraction method is one place where we would like to bring the technology from technological readiness level one or two to level three. Working package six is dissemination. 
Uh, we plan some uh, school for summer school for students, some exchange of students. But uh, what is probably most important, we should organize a workshop for stakeholders, so for all the people interested in in that project. So it's great. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>